There we go. All right, friends. So welcome to our courageous leadership time today. We're going to go ahead and jump in. And so with that, I want to welcome you to our 147th online gathering for congregational leaders across the country. This weekly gathering is called Courageous Leadership and it's sponsored by ELCA's coaching ministry. I'm Jill Beverly. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the program manager for this ministry and one of your facilitators today. As part of my traditional land acknowledgement, I would like you to know that my home is located on the Fox River in Appleton, Wisconsin. This area is the ancestral territory of five nations of Native Indigenous peoples, the Menominee Tribe, the Ho-Chunk Winnebago Tribe, the Potawatomi Tribe, the Oneida Tribe, and the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans and the Brothertown community. I honor and respect the diverse Indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which I live. So as we step into our time today, friends, I encourage us to remember that we are seeking to create a safer and braver space in these gatherings for you to bring the truth of who you are and how you are doing. These conversations are meant to be an intentional step to live more fully into God's dream for us as the body of Christ. So again, greetings and happy summer to you, friends. It's always good to be gathered together in this space. I missed being with you last week. I was journeying with the good people of the Northeastern Iowa Synod for their assembly. So today we are pleased to welcome into our space Deacon Tammy Devine. And uh, Pastor Dwight Du Bois was supposed to be with us. I don't believe that he's in our space yet. We're hoping that he'll still show up. But Tammy and Dwight shepherd an initiative called Life of Faith. And so with that, I'm going to let Tammy jump right to it. She has some things ready to share. So as we begin, I'm going to invite you to sit back in your chairs. with your back against the back of the chair, opening your shoulders and opening your heart space, taking a nice deep breath, breathing in God's goodness and exhaling all that's getting in the way of being present in this time today. I invite you to notice the weight of your body resting on the seat of your chair. Sink into it and let it hold you. Notice the rise and fall of your breath. Placing your hand on your abdomen, just notice the sensation of inhale and exhale, the gift of breath. Let you just to focus on your breath and as thoughts come and go as they will, your to-do list is, is trying to break in. Just breathe, breathing in God's abundant love. And taking this time to be present in our space. We're called to be light and so I light the candle reminding us that we are called to be light in the world. And in the midst of our gathering, among us, in us, and through us, the spirit is at work. I invite you to listen to these words, words uh, written by Joyce Rupp, to God who sings through us. God who sings in our hearts as a flute needs openness to receive the breath of melody. 
we pray to be open to the many ways that your symphony of love plays in our lives. Thank you for the way that your enlivening spirit touches us and moves through our beings. Remind us often that each one of us is a special instrument of yours. Together we create the wondrous music in your concert of love. You stand at the door of our hearts, asking for an entrance. You desire to come in and share the intimacy of your presence with us. Behold, we open the door of our minds and hearts. We welcome your entrance and long for a deeper union with you. Come and make music through our lives. Dance through our days and sing in our hearts. We have days when we resist your movement and message. We seek your stillness, but forget you in our busyness. We yearn for fullness, but miss you in emptiness. We welcome you in joy, but reject you in sorrow. We rejoice in the harvest, but struggle with the planting. Open our inner eyes so that we may know all, that we may know you in all the dimensions of our lives. Help us to trust you in the numerous ups and downs, to believe that your song can happen in all aspects of our existence. God of courage and strength, we are waiting to receive you loving energy in the empty corners of our hearts. It is your power working through us that can do more than we can ask or imagine. It is our, your enlivening breath moving through us that enables us to overcome anxieties, fears, doubts, and misgivings. Breathe through us, music maker. And let your song weave a melody through all we are and do. May we acknowledge your power at work in us and open ourselves to this blessing. You are a God who accepts the uniqueness and beauty of every individual. You love us as we are while you yearn for us to be more. You invite us to extend this kind of love to those who challenge our compassion and our patience. Your love within us will give us the strength to love them as we ought. Guide and encourage us to share our faith in all that we do. May your love sing through us. Amen. I invite you then as we conclude this time of open prayer and devotion to, to bring your fingertips to your forehead. Remembering that the Holy One is with us. Bring to mind this loving presence within you, around you as we pray. With fingertips to our forehead, say, open my mind to remember your presence. With fingertips to mouth, open my mouth to speak your wisdom. With fingertips to heart, open my heart to extend your love. And then holding both hands out, open with palms up. Open my hands to serve you generously. And then with arms wide open, open my whole being to you. 
Amen. So I still don't see our guest speaker who had a whole presentation prepared for you and I know put some good energy and time into sharing it. So I'm pitch hitting uh, like big time, which is, I, I'm not an improv person. I wish I was. Um, so, but that being the case, it is what it is. Um, Life of Faith is, is an initiative that really takes a look at the, the pillars of our faith, particularly vocation. Um, in the Reformation, we seem to have forgotten some of what Luther had hoped that we would be able to embrace as God's people, that all of our life is an opportunity for us to share our faith, to share our love, that it doesn't just happen in the God box, and that the God box is not just responsible for the ways in which we serve but that all of us through the waters of baptism, living out the five promises of our baptism, invites us that in every aspect of our life as mother, as niece, as father, as a farmer, as a janitor, anything that you can imagine, every aspect, everywhere we go, the invitation is for us to share God's love. And so the opportunity is to recognize that we are not only a gathered church, but we are also a scattered church. And I think that the, the concept of the life of faith is this opportunity to recognize that the message, think about how many more people could, could receive the message of God's love if every single one of us saw it as an opportunity in our daily lives to share the good news. Not necessarily proselytizing that, you know, God is love, got to do this, you got to do that. No, simply by being, by being the presence of God, by being that love, by being kind and compassionate and caring and following Christ's example of reaching out to those who are um, maybe not present, ever going to be present in our congregation. And we don't have to have to talk about Jesus. We have to just send the message of love. What does it mean to care for that person? So the opportunity um, with Life of Faith is really to re-engage what it means, what vocation means, and, and to really take a look at how the church in some ways has gotten in the way of that, because we have, um, we have kind of professionalized the ministry in a way that it's not every the baptized work to do. It's the people we pay to do the work. And that becomes somewhat of an obstacle for us in this process because we haven't necessarily equipped or commissioned God's people um, in a way that they feel ready to, to do that work. And so the life of faith is that opportunity to look um, at how do we equip, how do we support, how do we send that message and re-engage vocation from that lens. Um, and recognize what are some of the obstacles that we as church may have gotten uh, kind of snagged by, you know, words that, get, that they might get in the way, like ministry. So we think about just ministry, and ministry seems to be in the God box, right? Um, we don't oftentimes think about ministry as uh, being the, the neighbor to one another, of preparing um, of feeding the pigs um, so that they might be able to, um, to share uh, of their, themselves for us to have nourishment and food. So the, the call for um, vocation is, is this opportunity to see all of the gifts that God has given us, the gift of um, family, the gift of work, the gift of play as an opportunity for us to share our faith. This past weekend, uh, Dwight and I were in uh, Southwest Synod of Southwest Texas Synod, uh, where we launched a Life of Faith uh, initiative. I, I know that that wasn't the intent to share about that, but I found it really exciting to think about some, some of the things that were shared. 
One was thinking about how is our worship equipping God's people for daily life? When we think about confession and forgiveness, a part of our daily, our, our, our Sunday morning liturgy, oftentimes we do it and we think about it for ourselves, but we don't think about it as a tool that we can carry into our daily life. So as you think about it, how is it that that, that practice is, can help us when we have struggles within relationships at work or at home? What are some of the ways in which the entire liturgy supports our daily life. And that I think has, we have some work to do in that. I know that in seminary it, it came up and I remember it, but then I kind of forgot it. And I'm thinking that the, so, there's some folks who probably were never in seminary and there were some congregations that never taught that. So I think there's a great opportunity for us to equip God's people so that we come to the, our congregations to be supported and fed and nourished so we can go back out um, and think about the number of disciples that will be we are multiplying in that process when we open the door and we invite that message to be shared in all of life. That was pretty good Tammy for an a person who's not impromptu. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I know that there are some videos and I don't know uh, if, if any of those are up. There's, a, there's a, a one about the council meeting. Could you, do you see that one, Jill? Is it the introductory one? Well, we could do the introductory one. It's, is it a two minute or pretty short one? It's 17 minutes. Oh, that's too long. Um, okay. let's, there's one that has uh, little um, figures and it's, it's got a Zoom meeting and it's got, uh, a, a council meeting, church council meeting. Sure. You see that Hang one? On. Hang on one second. Okay. An animated? Yes. Yes, that's the Council one. meeting. Okay. Yeah. All right, kids. Hang on one second. I'll say while you're while you're um, you're working on that, one of the reasons that I got involved in this is because this has been work that's been going on for um, from a long time, right? It's Lutheran, all the way down to back to Luther, and there's been starts and fits fits and starts of this kind of whole initiative in in various forms uh, throughout the history of our church. Um, one of the things that we've added to Life of Faith is the coaching component to help. The, with the accountability in this and supporting uh, the congregations to kind of, to move into that process because it's a culture change, and culture change, as all of us know, is slow, takes time, and has needs some accountability in the process. And so the coaching component is how I got involved in this process to begin with. And we have ELCA coaches that are supporting congregations in Southeast Pennsylvania, Southwest Pennsylvania. Uh, cohort uh, of, of the Willing, which has some congregations in Arizona and Iowa and Wisconsin, and we have um, the Southwest Texas uh, congregations. Synod. Ready? I'm ready. All right. Are you seeing it? Yes. Okay, here we go. Hi, everyone. Hi. Good evening, all. Kathy, I think you're muted. Jerry, get the dog out of here. Kathy, you're still muted. Dang it, sorry. Thanks everyone for taking time out of your busy lives for yet another virtual church council meeting. Trisha, can you give your report on uh, God's Work Our Hands event? Sure, Jamal. Thank you. Last month, our congregation did a service project spread out in the church parking lot. We assembled personal hygiene kits for our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Volunteers filled zip-top bags with hand sanitizer, masks, toothpaste, toothbrushes, mouthwash, personal wipes, stuff like that. We created over 400 kits in one afternoon. Thank you, Patricia. Great work. Feels good to be doing good, especially in these tough times. Okay, um, Ben, maybe you can give an update on the food shelf. Gladly. With the interior of the church building off-limits to anyone but staff for the time being, we wanted to make sure that neighbors using the food shelf can still access the food they need. 
So you know how the west entrance has a kind of vestibule in between the outer doors and the inner glass doors? Well, just this week we replaced those inner doors with lockable doors and then moved the food shelf into the vestibule between the doors. So now we can leave the outer doors unlocked and people can come get food. Thanks, Ben. Great creative solution to keep that important ministry going. Okay, let's see. Uh, next is uh, Beverly's budget report. Uh, Jamal, can I jump in here for a second? It's kind of related. Sure, go ahead, Hyunjun. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard about the devastating fire earlier today that destroyed an apartment building and a grocery store behind it just over in Kathy's neighborhood. Well, as you can imagine, there's now a bunch of displaced people who need our help, particularly water, food, blankets, clothes, stuff like that. My family felt called to help out, so shortly before this meeting, we grabbed a whole bunch of groceries and clothes and things and dropped them off at the Methodist Church just down the block from the fire. They're gathering volunteers to help distribute supplies and find shelter for folks. I encourage you all to help out if you can. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you for lifting that up, Hyunjun. As soon as we're done, I'll make social media posts on the church's accounts and send out an email to the congregation. You're right. People do need to act quickly. Wow, what a tragedy. Good for you for helping out, Hyunjun. Um, I do think we need to coordinate a response through the church, maybe as an extension of our food shelf program. We can have members drop off their donated supplies here, and we can bring them over in the church van. Uh, thanks, Ben, but I don't think that's necessary. It's so simple to just buy or donate what you have and get it over there as quickly as you can. Time is of the essence. Yeah, but the church should be involved somehow. I mean, it's what we do as a Lutheran church. We serve our neighbors. So bring stuff to church and leave it in the vestibule, and I'll bring them over in the van. I'll also see if that church needs volunteers, and then I can create a sign-up genius so our members can register to help out. Uh, ben, I see your point, but I think that will just slow things down. People can just respond as they're able. No need to involve the church directly. With all due respect, why are you guys fighting me on this? This is what we do as a church. How can we be doing God's work our hands to help our neighbors if we don't do it as a church? Kathy, you're still muted. Dang it, sorry. Um, look, I think I see the problem here. And Ben, it's not you and it's not your fault. It's all of us. Look, we all tend to live out our faith like this, focused on the church. We're so used to the congregation being the expression of our faith in the world that when the world needs something else, we don't know how to respond. We are absolutely called to serve the neighbor, but principally we're called as individuals in all the parts of our lives. Pardon me, Kathy, but can't we impact many more people when we work together? I mean, we just heard about the food shelf and the hygiene kits. Oh yes, our food shelf is an amazing service. And those hygiene kits will be a great help. And so is Hyunjun's quick response. And so is Lois caring for her late husband. And so is Ben's humble service as an ethical business owner. And Jamal's graceful patience as a loving father and husband. It's like we think the only way that a church can respond to the needs of the neighbor is when we do it as a whole congregation. And that is not Lutheran, not at all. We are called to be in the world, each of us. Yet we've allowed ourselves to be shackled to this church building as the only place we think our faith in action really matters. Every part of your life is living out your faith, raising your kids, doing your job, paying your taxes, strengthening our communities, caring for your aging parents. It's all a calling. It's all holy. Wow. Uh, I think I get it, Kathy. You're reminding us that our congregation does great work helping people when we are gathered. But when we focus only on what we do together, we lose sight of the amazingly wide variety of ways that individually and as families, we love and serve people. We have opportunities to serve God by serving our neighbors and family day in and day out. Imagine the impact our congregation has when we think of it that way. Wow. Wow. So can I deliver this budget report now? Really, Beverly? If the pandemic has taught us anything, it has taught us that we are still the church, God's called out people, even when we are not gathered together. So I hope that that resonated with you. I, I know that when we shared that uh, this week, past weekend, 
it, there were some ahas that went off uh, that happened as as a result of that. All of the talking that had happened and all of the examples that we had given, it so resonated as the church council uh, meeting that they uh, they heard unique the unique message there uh, that was so important for them to embrace and for them to think about how that might take root in their in their particular context. So. Uh, what what was your reaction to that uh, to that message in the council? Here I am talking with <laughs> mute on. <laughs> okay, I resemble that remark. Um, the idea of just they knew each other well and i always think it's wonderful because you know sometimes the focus of the church is to keep building and get more members and that whole thing and what i really also know about small communities small churches is they know each other well they know each other's strengths they know each other's families they know who's up to help out at something in the community and so it's just a different vibe sometimes, um, but they both bring, you know, lots of opportunities. And I was just thinking about how, how wonderful it is when you really know people that you work with, like on a council and you know each other's lives, how, what a blessing that is. So and that really, thank you for that, Janet. That was part of the process as well, because I think as, met, as many of us who gather together in, in the church building, Think we know each other there are so much that we don't know about each other so there's some intentional formation in this process to really look at what are the gifts what are the values and how how are they shared and how might they fill gaps that we might not have thought about before so um, a deeper growth in that process was really a helpful step in them to be able to listen more inten intensely with the message of what life of faith has um, I think I saw Dwight come on. Did he not stay? <laughs> all right. It, it feels like he's maybe having internet trouble and can't make it all the way into the room just by how his Zoom is acting. Okay. Well, Tammy, and, uh, oh, yes. go ahead. No, go ahead. The weather, the weather and the cloudiness and whatever. <laughs> I, I agree with the, the theme of the film <clears throat> as far as it went. Um, because it's my experience, if you ask the average Lutheran or Protestant for that matter, or just about any Christian, what is your minute? What is your uh, ministry? And they'll begin talking about what they do in their congregation. And <clears throat> I, my, my, what I've been thinking about for many years now is how do we counter that and help people be more Lutheran by. Uh, what can we do? And one of the things that I'm aware we could do is that I think most congregations are not even aware of, of what the vocation of their members is. There's no list listing vocations. And if there were, what I'd like to see congregations do is, is maybe a Sunday a month have a, a part of the liturgy where they call forth a certain vocational group, teachers, businessmen, nurses, whatever, and celebrate their ministry briefly. Uh, by having one of them talk about his or her ministry and, and then having a special prayer for that, that ministry that people are doing in their daily life. And the other thing I, I'm become convinced of but haven't done that much about yet is that I think we need to act ecumenically. And one of the ways we can act ecumenically is by, and, and the film pointed this out, but uh, not congregation to congregation, but individuals who share the same vocation or the same workplace could be meeting uh, for for lunch or breakfast and discussing what how their work is going, what their what their ministry is, and uh, how they can make their particular sector of the economy work in a more healthy manner, and, and that they all see that and that that be a time of prayer, but also joint reflection on, on the people's ministries in their workplace. And that should be done ecumenically because when we go to our workplace, we look for other Christians. We just shouldn't be looking for Lutherans. 
that just anyone who understands the theology that the kingdom of God is here and that's what we're working at and that religion is something more than how we get to heaven. So each of the congregations that has been participating in this, there is not a guidebook, so to speak. There's a book that Dwight has written, um, scatter, uh, Scattering, but there, there is not necessarily a program. This isn't a program. This is about uh, living out our faith. Um, and so every context will find a different way to do that. And some of those contexts have found just what John has, has, has shared, affinity groups, uh, around uh, a particular vocation and the, the opportunity to support one another, to, uh, to learn together, to pray together, to interact with each other about the challenges and the joys uh, in their particular vocation. And then the opportunities for sendings in our worship service uh, and, and commissioning of the various vocations are ways and all steps that, that we can start to take as congregations to recognize, to embrace, and to empower all of God's people in the ministry that we all have been called to. So with that, I think we can go into small groups. Is that true? Yes, I didn't know we were going to small groups. So it'll take me just a second to build the breakout rooms. But I think that that's a good thing because it, it allows everyone a chance to reflect on the beautiful things that you have shared. So hang on one second, friends. So I, some, of, some of the questions, and we'll get those typed into the room, are, you know, where do you find hope in this message? What are some of the obstacles that you see for helping God's people to live out their faith in daily life? <coughs> and then our, our ongoing question that it's kind of the constant, <coughs> what is your first faithful step and supporting discipleship in your midst. Okay, I'm ready to go if you are. I am. Friends, we'll come back a little before the hour as we always do. Um, I put the um, website on the in the chat. If you take a, a peek at that and notice the extension is info. Um, if you go to a word, you're at the wrong organization. You're in a weird organization. Um, life of faith info and right on our homepage is just the video but i'm going to share the trailer for the video with you to give you a taste of what this video is is like and a taste of what we're talking about so um share sound i can't optimize the clip either but we'll see what this plays like i had unconsciously separated parts of my life from my faith without even realizing i was doing it we often become confused. We think that the primary agent for God's mission in the world is the congregation itself. I had blinders on when I was in parish ministry. My blinders focused me on the congregation. We think that we're only being Christian when we are coming and being in the church building. We began to realize how deep of a chasm there was between faith and real life. We're gathered together and then we are sent into the world as servants for our neighbors. This is nothing new. This is so deeply embedded in our denominational DNA. The problem is we talk about it in, in generic terms. And the only time we get specific is when we're talking about things that we do in and through the gathered church. We're equipped to put the focus of the church's mission on what we do in service to neighbors in the world helping people see what God is already doing in and through their daily lives for the sake of their neighbor. Then people will see the connection. Then church will be about my life. It just washed over me, just this whole idea of God working through us and hands and feet and it being very personal. I'm called to help people and that comes in a variety of ways. I feel like my career is one of those ways. I'm trying to help parents essentially raise their children and become good human beings that can go out into the world and do wonderful things. I feel like what I'm doing is actually affecting other people's lives, which makes me a lot happier. And I could be that authentic Christian through my actions and through how I behaved and how I held other people up. That is the trailer. Um, I, this video is so powerful that I had considered showing you the whole video as the majority of my presentation with you today, 
and then decided no, I'd back off and do a normal presentation because you can watch the, the video on your own, but that's on that's on our homepage. And we will get the file to you since you had the conversation of a file called What's Next? Um, what what can you do if you want to start working on this? Which which way can you go? And this has um a couple couple pages of helpful information in there for you. So I'll leave it at that. My screen, my screen sharing ability is messed up. So we'll just forget that I had another another uh, screen and just enter into this blessing as a way for us to close our time together. This is a poem called Scent. It was written by Steve Garnis Holmes and he has a blog called Unfolding Light. And, uh, and this is one of his, his poems. He quotes Matthew 10, seven to eight. Proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Steve writes, you are given power and authority and sent, not to proselytize, not to enact Christian legislation, but to heal. In your workplace, in your community, in your family, how can you possibly do this? because you are given power and authority. You are given love, which casts out fear, slowly, to be sure, but it does cast out fear. You won't cast out all the demons of greed or racism or cure the whole epidemic of loneliness or despair, but you will love even one person at a time. And maybe your witness will move crowds, but remember, you are an empty vessel. It is not your power, but God's. And through your vessel, though your vessel is small, that power is infinite. Go then, and peace be with you. Amen. Amen. Tammy, that is beautiful. Thank you, Tammy and Dwight, for bringing this important subject to our space today. I am, like I said, just back from another Synod Assembly. And friends, one of the consistent themes that I have heard as I have traveled as a churchwide representative to Synod Assemblies this season is the lament of, we thought we would have more children. We thought we would have younger families. And this deep-seated fear of, we will die if we don't have this. And I was sharing with Tammy at the beginning, um, before you all arrived, that I've, I've really tried to honor the fear that people are naming and at the same time invite them to set that aside and instead focus on just what Tammy was naming. The fact that the kingdom of God has come near in each of us. To not discount the call that is right here, right now, within each of us and within each congregation. And how would things be different today if we truly believed that and behaved as if that were true? That today, because you woke up, your eyes opened, breath came into your lungs, there is something very specific that God, that God has called you to do, that God has gifted you to do. And what does it look like if we tell ourselves and the people around us, our job is to figure out what that is and how to use these gifts to join in God's enterprise of loving and healing the world. And so friends, look at each face on this screen. The kingdom has come near through each of you. You are image bearers. Yes, thank you, Janice. And you are conduits of God's love. And so every week when I say you are seen, you are valued, and you are loved, those are not just words, my friends. Those are things that I feel right here. Why do you think I leave every week just smiling and laughing? It's because I've been lifted up through God's spirit flowing through each of you. So thank you, friends. Thank you for what you do in this space, for what you do in your congregations, for what you do in your communities, in your households, in the world. It's making a difference. God bless you. I'll see you next week.